Hi, this is Keith Spiro with another session at Communicast talking about the great things good people are doing. And with me is Khalil Shreet from Duet, which is a partner right now with our vendor to Southern New Hampshire University, and Andrew Volinsky, who is a counsel running for governor of New Hampshire. And the purpose of this meeting, very much so, is focus on education but also focus on the grassroots piece of it. All three of us come from backgrounds, first in families to be heading into college, the cost of college going up, the difficulties of, of these different times. And so the two of you have never met, and I know both of you very well. And my purpose in bringing us together was to start this conversation around what Duet is doing as a vendor to Southern New Hampshire University, particularly at a time where the COVID-19 issues, raise the stakes. People are working and how do you work and go to school at the same time? How can you afford an education? And SNHU made a decision to keep people remote this coming year. So Khalil, I turn it over to you to give us a little background on just what Duet does and the fascinating thing that I see with mentorships. Thank you so much, Keith. It's a pleasure to be here and join you today. Um, you know, it's, it's, it seems that the whole world changed, uh, you know, uh, before us overnight. Uh, with enormous societal change happening, um, you know, many of them that were underway in higher education, you know, over the past few decades. And, you know, I, I, I came from, from Syria about seven years ago to study at SNHU. I faced, you know, several challenges with access and, and with support and, you know, with financial challenges, but it was only through the support of the university that I was enrolled at at SNHU, I was able to make it. And with that degree, I was able to make you know, dramatic transformation over my life, you know, have much more control and be much more impactful uh, and can contribute to my communities. Then, you know, getting more experience working with the university, I learned that these issues, you know, were facing all Americans, right? The majority of Americans. And, uh, you know, if you look now at, at, at the state of higher education, you'll find that, you know, there have been enormous levels, of, you know, of, of uh, borrowing, for higher education, there has been, you know, more and more challenges uh, for access with only 20, 27%, nearly 27% of today's uh, current um, college students being traditional students. The rest of, you know, are working adults, parents, and other with, other, others with competing priorities. And if you look at the, you know, average college programs, they're not designed to support these populations. So. Through our work now building, you know, on, on our partnership with Southern New Hampshire University, um, we were able to truly innovate around access and success at higher education, where we bring quality higher education, you know, through Southern New Hampshire University to much larger populations, most of those who were underserved uh, within the constraints of the current systems. I very much appreciate that, Khalil. And what caught my attention <clears throat> coming from the startup world down in Cambridge and the expanded ecosystem of business startups, entrepreneurship, and in New Hampshire, where it's a growing foundation for the future of education, future of business, two things that really stuck out strongly. One was the mentorship piece that you assign a person to work with the students so that they have that fallback position, basically mentoring apprenticeship support while they're going through school. And the second part is that it's not a traditional going through a series of classes and tests for the degree, but it's based on a project. So that these students coming through the duet program are project oriented, completion of project is what leads to the degree, which also allows them to vary the amount of time it takes. And that's what started my thinking that the three of us should talk because this is as much about entrepreneurship and the new way of approaching education. COVID-19 has taken down so many gatekeepers, and I say this constantly. It's a time to have a refresh and look at what we're doing. How do we educate that next generation? How do you take somebody from an average or poorer background and give them the boost or bootstrap they need to get ahead in life? And I can't think of anyone that is more concerned about education than Andy Walensky, who I've known for a good number of years in a variety of capacities. Yeah. And uh, please, you know, you, well, you... I am uh, intrigued by a lot of what Khalil had to say. Um, some of it because it resonates with my own experience. 
I went to a struggling high school in a mill town where the mill failed uh, and won a scholarship to college. Uh, but I got to college and realized that I didn't have any study skills. Um, I did well in high school, but that was because I did my homework on the bus, uh, put me ahead of everyone who didn't do their homework. Um, and so there was a lot for me to learn to catch up uh, with the other students. But having had access to that educational opportunity um, with a little bit of time off, um, I worked as a carpenter and then went to law school. And so I've been a lawyer for just about 40 years. And one of the most important things I've done as a lawyer is challenge how New Hampshire funds its schools. Um, because there are some parts of our state where the schools are just wonderful, but there are many parts of the state where the schools really struggle. And ironically, those are the parts that have the highest taxes. So we have a very regressive model. But I'm intrigued by, in part, what you're saying and something that Keith just referenced. Um, and that is, with COVID-19 in the school setting, the K-12 to setting, we went to remote learning overnight. And some families could adapt to that. Some school systems could adapt to that, but many could not. And, and it's beyond not having access to a laptop like we have in front of us. It's how do you supervise? How do you work with? How do you mentor? the child who may be sixth, seventh, eighth, tenth grade isn't used to getting all of her learning remotely and now both has to figure out how to plug into remote learning, how to make the time so she can focus on what's happening. And then at the same time, how does she interact with other kids that are being asked to accommodate and adapt in the same way? So you're, you're talking about doing it at the college level. I, I want to hear more about the mentorship part because there are too many who think you put the teacher in front of the classroom and the teacher teaches. And so it doesn't matter whether you're sitting in the classroom or on the other end of the internet, you're getting the same experience. That's not how it works. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's how it fails. So how do we break out of that model and what's your, I assume there's a research basis for the approach that you're promoting. I, I want to hear some more about that and I, I want to hear how it's working. First, well, that's, that's a great point here. And you know, we often hear that people confuse online education with remote learning. You know, what's, what's happening right now with our schools rush to move to, you know, in their move online is, you know, that they're, really developing remote learning uh, technologies and programs in which they try to establish connections or bridges between professors, between teachers and students. That's it. But technology is playing very little or has very little to, little to do in between, right? It's only delivery. However, with online education that we have here, we feel very, very fortunate and grateful for our uh, partnership with, um, SNHU, you know, Southern New Hampshire University is now the largest nonprofit provider of online education right now in the country with enormous programs here, you know, on national and international levels that were designed for truly the future of learning. So here, you know, th uh, at, through this partnership, we are not concerned about the quality of learning. All, edu all, the, 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 all learning happens at, directly at SNHU. SNHU provides the courses provides the, you know, access to the, to the programs, professors, uh, the, the degrees, and, and the, you know, the graduation commencements. Khalil, what I'd like to do is just bring this to an even broader level, because you talk about success partners, and it strikes a chord from the corporate world where we had success cases. So, Andy, how do we now kind of bridge, because technology to me and startups offer ideas, but the implementation also requires an experienced hand that broadens its impact and makes it an affordable cost across the community. Well, you're absolutely right. So one of, one of my daughters uh, works for a tech startup in Oakland um, and they're beyond the angel stage into I think their second or third round of financing. So they're 
they're not a child company anymore, but more like an adolescent. Um, and, you know, companies, tech companies in particular, go through these stages as they mature and refine their product. And at different times, you do need the check-ins. Um, it's good for the company, it's good for the product. In your case, it's really good for the community to see that the idea of making um, college level education available broadly, credentialing people so that they can build successful economic lives uh, is really important. So let me take this conversation one step higher as well because New Hampshire Tech Alliance today announced a program to bring tech people together. When you think of the technology funnel, new ideas coming, success requires government, private citizens, educators, businesses to all work together. And as we look to the future of New Hampshire, how do we create this funnel for things that are coming out of startup incubators, new businesses, successes, and get them up to the government level where they can be implemented. You know, schools right now are struggling to figure out what to do with the back to school level. And while Duet's focus is very much in this post-secondary and, and college level, the idea of mentors, success partners, affordability all come together. But as you've said several times, you're only one small sliver of what this particular university is doing. Take that to, you know, your executive counselor level, and, and how do you get a good level of communication? Manchester is very exciting right now with what's going on, with some of the other interviews I've done specifically with tech startups. People love to be here. People are coming into our state. And so how do we tap into the collective technology, intelligence, excitement of the rising generation and filter to that into or help make the change? Startups are disruptors systems don't like to be disrupted and we have to merge the two together through communications. Yeah. So I, I think the role of government is really to offer building blocks that in these cases, entrepreneurs can use. So to uncomplicate the matter, think of the old towns that were first being built up and the federal government put a post office there. Now you had some entity that could rent a space and it became a bit of a focus. And then maybe a state agency went there and that brought more people. You need to think about tech startups in, in somewhat the same way. So some tech startups require highly educated young students. And so the idea of putting UNH Manchester in the mill yard makes a ton of sense, right? Um, some startups, some people can't leave to form startups because their health insurance comes from their former employer and they have a need to stay insured. They can't take that risk. So the kinds of things that we can do to break that connection between employer and health insurance starts to allow entrepreneurs to be a little more free thinking, right? Because you can get your health insurance elsewhere. It's, it's not this discussion, but it's one of the reasons I'm so supportive of Medicare for all type approaches, because it breaks that, that bond. Energy costs some tech startups require a lot of electricity um, because of the nature, they're more manufacturing oriented. We have some of the highest electricity costs in the nation. If we bring those down, it becomes a building block for that tech startup to use. There are occasions where the government itself can purchase some of the services. And so when you were talking, Khalil, the, the idea of those contracts for state employees to go sign up for schooling at a SNU with a duet program or at a UNH Manchester with a state stipend, that starts to prime the pump. Um, and that is a very appropriate role, I think, 
uh, for a government because it becomes an instigator, an aggravator, a starter of new developments that will take others to chip in and grow and entrepreneurs have to have their own sweat equity in there. Um, but it creates an opportunity, not only for the entrepreneurs, but for the employees. So the hardworking people get to participate as well. So the more we can foster those models, and in a state like New Hampshire, I think we do that best with new small companies and growing small to mid-sized companies. I, you, you don't, to my mind, you don't waste your time trying to attract Amazon to move its headquarters to Manchester. It's not going to happen, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't spend time there. But growing small entrepreneurial tech companies, exactly where we should be in a gig. Oh, and you need broadband. <laughs> we can't forget that, right? So you can't get good broadband access all across our state. And we should, because you should be able to build on a gig economy almost no matter where you are in New Hampshire. Thank you. I'd like to thank both of you gentlemen for spending the time with me today on this. It's just another one of those major topics that we build it right, the right people will find us here. We won't have to reach as far out to try to beg or ask or make major compromises on everyone's part to bring in a company. And by growing it locally and taking in the citizens, it makes a huge difference. So thanks for joining this conversation. I very much appreciate your time. Thank you, Keith. It's wonderful to meet you. Good luck, Khalil. Thank you very much, Mr. Bolanski. We'd love to reconnect later. Yes. And good luck with your campaign. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. You too. Have a good one.